Hello, I'm Graham, and I hope everyone's having a great day. And welcome to part four in this tutorial series I'm running for users of the Panasonic Lumix FZ80 or 82 bridge camera. Now, in part one, we looked at the IA Plus mode, and in particular, how it posed some severe limitations on you as a creative photographer. To overcome some of those limitations, we switched to the programmed auto mode or the P mode, and that allowed us to take better pictures because we're not restricted by the scene type that the camera determines. Again, the P type offered some restriction for you, so we looked at the aperture and shutter priority mode. But if you remember in that video, I said there's not much point using aperture and shutter priority with this particular camera, as when you move away from the wide angle position of the 20 millimeters effective focal length, the aperture range that you're allowed is so restrictive that you're not going to see any benefits in choosing one aperture or the other. And I can uh, illustrate that in the series of pictures here. Now, this waterfall I took at 20 millimeters at an aperture of f2.8. You can see it's clearly in focus from all the foreground all the way up to the background. So the argument about using a wide aperture such as f2.8 to give you shallow depth of field only really applies when you're using a telephoto lens. If you're using a wide angle lens, the inherent depth of field of a wide angle lens gives you that wonderful vista you see in that particular waterfall. If I went all the way up to f8 in that series, you'll see there's not much change in the depth of focus there. But you may notice there's a slight reduction in image quality due to what's called diffraction. And that's softening due to the way the light uh, rays are bent when they uh, go around a small diaphragm. Now, to overcome that, you would need to step up to a camera, something like the FZ300 or 330, which has got what's called a constant aperture lens. And that can stay at f2.8 all the way up to the telephoto position, where in the telephoto position on the FZ80, you're down to f5.9. The lens may stay open at f2.8, or the physical aperture size is at f2.8, but because of the way the elements are constructed and the way the lens moves out, the amount of light fall off between that lens aperture and the sensor means that we're down to a lower uh, amount of light, hence the equivalence of 5.9 f-stop, even though it is still possibly an f2.8 lens at that point. So with that restriction of a very small aperture of f5.9, it does mean you've got to use longer shutter speeds or higher ISOs to enable you to get the right exposure. Now that does create two problems. High ISO gives you noise in the image, and long shutter speeds means that you've either got subject motion blur if your subject is not static, or you may even introduce handshake if you are using extended telephoto positions. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the manual mode. And again, the manual mode doesn't really give you that much creativity with this particular camera for the same restrictions that you have when you're shooting in aperture or shutter priority mode. The range of apertures available to you once you move away from that 20 millimeter position is very restricted. And down at the 20 millimeter end, the depth of field created by the lens is such that you can't use the smaller apertures or the wider apertures to enable you to get shallower depth of field. Using the manual mode does teach you a lot more about photography in general, and it shows you how an image is constructed in terms of its exposure. Now, before we start talking about manual uh, exposures, it's really important to understand how exposure is calculated with the camera. Now, in this particular camera, there are three exposure modes, and those exposure modes are for the whole area, sometimes called evaluative metering, central weighted, where we just take the central area of the image, and the third image, which is more difficult to use, but more precise, is called spot metering. Now, it's that metering which determines the actual exposure, and it's important to use the right metering for the right subject. Well, it started to rain quite heavily on the moors, so as these cameras aren't waterproofed, I decided to continue this tutorial back indoors. We were talking about exposure metering, and how important that was to get the correct exposure. Well, exposure metering is accessed either through the main menu or directly through the quick menu. And the quick menu is this button over on the left hand side of the control. And it's indicated by this little icon here on the left hand side of the LCD screen. Now it can be set to one of three modes. One is the motor metering, which takes the whole of the area to consider what that exposure should be. The next one is the center weighted. It takes a central portion of the display so it can use that to eliminate some distracting background which may be brighter 
or darker than your original subject. So for example, in a portrait against the light, then if you set the metering mode to center weighted, it's likely to get the exposure correct rather than being influenced by the brighter background, giving you an underexposed subject. And the third one is the spot metering mode, which is a precise metering mode, uses a very, very small area of the screen, but you'll find it very difficult to use unless you understand the concept of tonality and the way to resolve color into a neutral gray. So it's ideal for something like the moon, where quite often you'll take a picture of the moon and all you'll get is a white orb if you're using the uh, whole area or the center weighted. But if you use the spot metering and target the spot on a crater in the moon, you'll find you'll get a perfect exposure. And we'll come back to that when we talk about some of the advanced modes the camera has. So we're going to set the metering mode to the whole area to begin with. So if I go back into the quick menu, cursor up into the metering mode set, and we'll go to multi-metering. So it's now taking the whole of the screen to evaluate how bright or how dark the image is. All camera metering systems rely on the fact that they try to integrate or resolve that color to what's called a neutral gray. And I have a neutral gray card here, which I'm going to superimpose to the front of the image. And that is the color that the camera expects everything to be. So if we just look at the exposure there, it's given me a tenth of a second at F4. Now, if I take the card away and we have a look at the exposure, it's given me a tenth of a second at F4. So it's the meter is actually resolving all the colors and all the background and giving me the correct exposure. So I'm going to take that shot and we'll have a look at that in the video. So that is the image that we've just taken and you can see that it's correctly toned, no blown highlights and the shadows are quite nice. Now, if I was to introduce a white card, you notice that we've got currently a tenth of a second of the exposure. If I put a white card there, you notice that the camera again tries to make that white card into a neutral gray. In fact, if I just scroll in a little bit so we get rid of the uh, gray background, that exposure now has gone to a thirtieth of a second and it's tried to make that white card appear as though it was neutral gray. If I take out the white card and substitute that for a black card, again, it will try and make that black card appear neutral gray. You can see that it's made the black card neutral gray, where in fact it is a total black card. And in fact, if I bring in that neutral gray card to give me the right exposure, you can see that that black card has now gone black. So the background can influence the way the exposure is determined by the camera. And that's why we use exposure compensation to compensate for the fact that our subject may be brighter or darker than its surrounding area. You'll notice here that I've got two thirds of an EV exposure compensation on that shot. And that is to make sure that I'm biasing the exposure towards the highlights. So I'm recording highlights without them blowing out. And for that reason, it doesn't make the shadows too dark so that we're getting noise in the shadows. But we'll talk about that again when we consider the histogram and some of the advanced features in a later video. If I was to select the centuated area, you'll notice again that it's still giving me that one tenth of a second because the tonality of this image is similar between the subject and the background, so it won't change the exposure. If I now switch to the spot metering mode, you'll notice that we can see that immediately the camera has changed the exposure to one twentieth of a second. So it's lost as one stop of exposure because it's trying to expose for that cyan cross that's in the middle of the focus area. If you can see the cyan cross there. And if I move that cross over to my neutral gray background, you notice our exposures come back to about that one tenth of a second because that spot metering now is trying to meter my neutral gray background. So you can see as I move that spot around the screen, it's changing the brightness of the image to try and make the area that's under that cyan cross exactly neutral gray. So that's why spot metering is particularly difficult to use unless you understand exactly where you're going to get a neutral gray component for the camera to measure. 
In this video I wanted to consider the manual mode and of course the manual mode is accessed by turning the top control dial until you align the M against the white index mark on the flash housing and again that's repeated by the fact you've got the M appearing on the LCD display. Now the manual control indicated by the M on the screen there gives you access to the shutter speed, the aperture and the ISO and all those three combined to give you the exposure triangle to give you the correct exposure. So I can change any one component and that will change the exposure. Now currently the shutter speed is set to 1 125th, the aperture is set to f4 and my ISO is set to 80. The meter scale at the bottom here is the exposure meter and it means that it's all the way to minus 3. It could be beyond minus 3 but the scale only goes to minus 3 to tell you that you're severely underexposed. You notice that if I half depress the shutter button you notice that the screen goes dark, the aperture and the shutter speed start to flash in red to warn you that you are out of control with the exposure. Now to adjust the exposure I can change one two or three component parts of that exposure triangle. So I could use the aperture, I could use the shutter speed or I could use the ISO to make this meter balance to the zero position. But for this particular shot I want to keep the aperture correct at f4 for that gives me the sweet spot or the sharpest point of the lens. I want to keep my ISO at 80 so I get the lowest noise in the image. So that leaves me just the shutter speed to change the way the camera will get the exposure. While the shutter speed is indicated in yellow, it means that the top control dial will now adjust the shutter speed. If I press in the back control dial, you can see it alternates between aperture and shutter speed. So I can change the shutter speed and if you watch the exposure meter, you notice it's coming away from the minus three and it's heading back to the zero. So you now know we're heading in the right direction. And a quick way to remember it is if the exposure is minus, turn the top control to the minus position and that gives you the opposite effect. I wanted to put plus two thirds of an EV on there so that I kept the exposure correct. But the normal exposure would be where you see plus and minus zero. It means the exposure meter is saying that's the correct exposure. That's one fifteenth of a second. If I take that picture, it will give me a perfectly normal picture and there would mean nothing wrong with that. But I want to try and bias my exposure a little bit towards the right so I'm lifting those shadows away from any noise that might be present in the image without pushing it too far and blowing out the highlights. So again, if I move the top control dial to the left, it will move my exposure indicator to the right towards the plus. And if I go two clicks, which would be two thirds of an EV um, over what the exposure meter has given me, I will take that picture Again, I'm getting no highlight warnings as I got that turned on. And if we look at the histogram, you notice it's within the upper and lower limits for the image. Again, we'll be talking about the usefulness of that histogram in a later video. Currently, my zoom position is 28 millimeters. And at that position, I've got control of my aperture from f3.2 all the way up to f8. But if you've been following along with this tutorial series, you've uh, been advised to stay away from that F8 setting and try to keep as low down in the scale as you can to get sharper images. But if I wanted more depth of field, if I'm finding that the F4 didn't give me sharpness from the front of this uh, flower here to the back, I might want to go to say F6.3. But having done so, the camera is now saying that I'm going to be two thirds of an EV underexposed. So to compensate for that, I can change my shutter speed again. So clicking over on the back control dial gives me the control of the shutter speed. We're on the minus position. So again, I'll turn this top control dial to the minus position and that will start to lengthen the shutter speed to increase that exposure. But again, I want to go to two thirds over for this particular shot to give me the exposure that I want. So now we've got now one quarter of a second at F6.3 and we'll take that picture. It will be exactly the same as the previous shot, but with more depth of field. Now, if this was a handheld shot and I wanted a 30th of a second exposure, then if I dial up one 30th of a second, 
So we've got one thirtieth of a second. I want to keep the same aperture because I want that particular depth of field. It means now that I've got to adjust the ISO to enable me to get the exposure meter to the center point. So again, to change the ISO, we've got the ISO control on the top of the navigation button. And again, by increasing the ISO, you'll see the exposure meter is going back towards the zero position. And if I wanted to go that two thirds of a stop overexposed, you'll see that I'm using ISO 640. So this will give me exactly the same image as the two previous shots. If we just take that. But we may notice a little bit more noise in this image. Now the amount of noise will depend on your subject brightness. Now here in the studio it's quite a bright light so I'm not expecting to see a lot of noise. But to exaggerate the point, if I go up to um, a shutter speed of 160 which would be one stop more to 125 which would be two stops more, I need to change my ISO again by two stops to make the meter balance again. So I'm going to change the ISO until my meter is showing my two thirds of a stop over and that is ISO 2500. Now if I take that picture and we look at that on the screen you notice there is a little bit more noise in that and the image is becoming a little softer. But in some situations you do have to use those high ISO numbers to enable you to get a handout shot which will prevent subject motion blur. Remember the optical image stabilization of the camera will only stabilize handshake or camera shake. It will not stabilize any movement in your subject. And that's likely to be one of the causes of your failed images because there's been subject motion rather than camera shake. So let's just reset that ISO back to where I want it for in the studio, the lowest ISO that the camera has, which is ISO 80. A useful feature in the manual control is in fact setting in what's called auto ISO. Now at the moment my shutter speed is 1 30th of a second and my aperture is at 6.3 and if we look at the exposure with auto ISO it's saying that exposure should be ISO 400. Let me just take that shot to confirm that. Now if I was to turn off one of my studio lights, so if I turn off one of my main lights, the shutter speed is still going to be 1 30th, the aperture is still going to be f6.3, but for the camera to keep the same exposure it's going to change the ISO and it's gone from 400 to 800 which is just one stop. Everything will be the same in that second image, except we should see just a little bit more noise because we've gone from ISO 400 to ISO 800. And again, if I turn on that studio light, then the camera will automatically change the exposure to make the exposure correct. So that's a useful feature in your manual mode. And to make that work, you need to make sure that your ISO limit set is going to be a reasonable number. Now, normally I would have that set to 400, but you notice my exposure is ISO 400, so that's still in control at that point. But if I turn off my studio light, you notice it's still giving me ISO 400 and the subject is going dark because the camera cannot go more than 400 because I've set the limit. And you notice that the camera is showing we're now minus a complete stop underexposed. So remember, if you are going to use this to either turn off the uh, ISO limit, so it will use uh, all the ISO range the camera has, or set it to a sensible high number that you don't want to, it to exceed so that you're not getting too much noise in your image. Now if you notice I've been using the display key to cycle through some of the options that you can set with a camera. And for example here now I'm on the shooting screen which will give me access to exposure compensation. So if I just touch that I can change the exposure compensation directly to what I want. Press set to lock it in. Now the other options on here, if the button appears to have a rounded corner then it's accessible. So for example the Focus mode selection is accessible because I've got control. Um, things like auto white balance isn't because that's not got a rounded rectangular corner. It's, it's just like a black button. Same with the um, eye contrast. Again, that's not changeable. The metering mode isn't changeable, but things like raw or the quality indicator 
can be changed. Again, Wi-Fi can be turned on or off. The aspect ratio can be turned on and off. The action to the functions can. And the um, standard um, or monochrome, dependent on the uh, particular mode you're in. Here we're in the IA plus mode. So this gives you access to some of the features that you can set. If I was in the um, P mode, then you notice now we've got auto white balance, intelligent resolution, access to the metering mode because now these have changed from black to grey. So if the background of the button is grey, it means you've got access to control that. In the replay mode, the display button allows you to cycle through the view options to show you what that particular image has got. But more of that in the advanced section when we look at some of the advanced features and how to get even more quality out of the camera with just a little bit more effort. Well, that's it for this particular video, highlighting the metering modes and access to the manual exposure. Hope you found that useful. I have an exposure guide which is freely downloadable and I'm going to put a link to that in the video description below. Also access there to my photographic blog and the application to join the uh, fortnightly newsletter. So all that will be in the video description below. Now in the next video we're going to start looking at shooting video with this particular camera and that is where I believe the strength lies. You've got 4K uh, photo and video modes uh, as well as 1080p and it's in that 4K video mode that we've got some outstanding features. We'll also be looking at uh, time lapse and stop motion animation as well in that particular video. So I look forward to bringing you that. So until the next video as usual thanks very much for watching. Please do take care. And I hope to see you all in that video. Bye for now.